Okay, I'm going to start the recording. Hi, welcome. I uh, don't, do, don't have too many people here yet. Um, so uh, I might I'll go ahead a few announcements maybe first. Uh, as usual, feel free if you have questions or stuff. Um, let me see, let me go back to this. Uh, oh, well, first of all, um, uh, there's a bit of weather going through here in the commerce area. I don't know if if uh, both of you or anybody else that joins later here is local or not, but uh, but yeah, there's a 50 50 chance my power could go off or internet. So, I mean, if that happens, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, might have to record it offline or something, whatever, wherever we end up stopping, but uh, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, for, for you guys that are here or anybody that watches later on, um, um, I wanted to mention about, um, I posted some problem sets that I'm calling them. Um, hopefully I, I explained it well enough so that people can understand if you read all that, but um, uh, I, I'm not going to add any extra work. So, you know, at this point, uh, I'm kind of too late to, to get in these assignments. Um, and I didn't want to add in any extra time to people that have gotten used to, you know, uh, the, the amount of work that we've been doing so far. But um, I had some people um, were asking for some more like problems, really. So, so practice problems, especially things for like um, that would be helpful with uh, comprehensive exam sorts of things. So um, I'm going to try and post a few problems each week in these problem sets. Um, I usually just go over to content. Um, and then you'll find them. So I did post one for the previous week eight um, and one for this week as well. So I think you have to click all the way down in here to, to find the attachment anyway. So um, I'm not going to, there is a, there is a, a submission drop box. You can, you can do these and submit these. Um, I'll try and talk about these. I'm not gonna talk about, I'm probably not gonna talk about this one uh, on the number systems, it's, it's all it's all questions about converting between bases. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll post an example solution on that. Uh, probably, I, I probably I will maybe do these problems like the week after. So maybe next week I'll do some of the problems that I had for the um, uh, the problem set that I had for this week's materials on computer arithmetic. So. Um, if you submit those, I will be happy maybe to, to use those for a little bit for extra credit. Um, so as I mentioned, maybe I can go up to, let's say like a letter grade, so maybe 10 points equivalent on one of our tests, um, uh, um, which is, it's fine. It's be, people are asking a little bit about if, if they could do a little bit to get a bit of extra credit. So maybe I'll use those. So, but again, I'm probably not going to really grade these and return back individually for a grade. I'll just do a, you know, submitted or not submitted and, if, if you did all of them or most all of them, you know, I'll give you some of those, some, some points back on a test. I probably won't even add a grade, a grade book item for these uh, problem sets. Um, um, I'll, I'll just look at the end of the class and see who was kind of submitting those. I, I mean, I will probably look at them and at least make certain that it was looked like a, like a valid attempt. You know, you weren't just submitting it after I posted example solutions and just posting the solution um, and, and, and you did some work, but otherwise, um, uh, you know, you'll have you'll have to kind of look at any solutions I post, or kind of come to these help sessions if you have some questions about those. If you are working on these problem sets, so. Doctor Harder. Yeah, sure. On that first question, I went ahead and looked at them. I, I did kind of the first four already on that little problem set. Right. The very first question, when you're doing from one base to another base. Yeah. Okay. Like the fifty-four A. I converted that to decimal first, then to convert it to the other base. Right. So, so I did. Is that the correct way to do it? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's there's really no. I mean, it's you could probably figure out a procedure to to convert those directly, but uh, but no. I mean, the, the it'll, it'll it'll be faster to convert to ten base ten every everything to base ten and then back into the base. So yeah, that's that's the correct. Um, okay. Okay. Approach. So I got. Yeah. Okay, so. 54 to 44, and then convert that to base five. Well, I think it was 105, something like that. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, I, it, probably, I mean, a lot of these probably people could check on their own, but um, but yeah, I'll, I'll post what I came up with with those. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, these are good, you know, 
like these, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have like a comprehensive exam question that was just converting bases, but certainly for computational architecture and other courses that they'll, 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 they'll there could be questions that assume, you know, you know what binary is, or you know how to convert that to, to decimal or things like that. So, so yeah, in that sense, these are also good practice just uh, in general for computational architecture and, and many other kinds of courses. So, yeah. Um, All right, so yeah, like I said, probably next week I'll I'll look at the problem set that I posted for the chapter today. Although I'm, I'm probably gonna I, I, I got a lot of materials today, so maybe we'll get into them here. Um, um, there, there's a lot more stuff on this chapter, um, and um, and yeah, I did want to see if I could work through a problem or two um, um, similar to some of the ones that I uh, posted on the second problem set here. So. Let's go again. Oh, there was one other thing. Um, I just wanted to bring it to people's attention that uh, besides that, so today I am going to be using, um, uh, I'm going to be using a lot from this example program that I wrote. Uh, so um, I'll bring that up once once I want to refer to it. But uh, uh, this code in here that we're going to look, be looking at today, um, you can pull that down yourself. Um, if you want to, and, and it should compile if you have a C++ compiler, so all in a single file. So it should compile without too much problem if you want to try it out. But uh, but but yeah, if, if you're curious, uh, that is on there as well um, that we'll be looking at uh, here. So um, all right. So the, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, this chapter is um, an important one. Um, if you've never kind of thought about the details of how things are represented. So, so we're, we're mostly talking about numerical rep representations um, today in the chapter. So in, in particular, integers and floats. So how those are represented, um, what the trade-offs are, so why you represent them in particular ways. I mean, the, the basic answer of why computer architectures are going to represent an integer in one way versus another is because, you know, we're, we're looking at performance. So we're looking at how costly it is to implement the algorithms to do common operations with those numerical types um, um, in the computer. So, you know, ultimately um, the arithmetic logic unit um, is the subcomponent that supports uh, these arithmetical computational arithmetic that we're talking about here. It also supports a logical computation. So that's like a Boolean. Um, uh, if this is less than that, or if this and that or that. So, so logical computations are usually part of the ALU as well, right? Uh, we might talk, I think the next chapter, we, we talk a little bit about some of those as well as designing at the circuit level for um, Arithmetic, arithmetic, um, arithmetical um, operations. So, um, so yeah, the, the the general idea before I move on here um, is that the, I mean the ALU, you know, you, we're talking about grade level arithmetic here. So adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, um, some. Some computer architectures might support like maybe raising to a power, although that's not very common, um, but usually just the basic arithmetic, right? Um, but, you know, to get a computer to perform those operations, um, take some thought um, and some representations and some ways of doing it. So, so you really have to have an algorithm. So again, remember the computers are relatively dumb. You know, you have to be very specific about the steps to perform in order to do some work or perform a computation. And here, especially because we're talking about that this stuff all has to be implemented um, in hardware, you know, in, in the, uh, the, the processor of our computer architecture, you know. So we have to have the, the circuits that if you place data in memory um, and then transfer it to particular registers on the processor, and then you call a particular opcode to do, for example, an addition operation, then the, the circuits implement the logic to refer to, for example, two registers 
to add those registers together, assuming that, that the bit values in there represent, let's say, an uh, unsigned or assigned integer value, and then putting the results somewhere, like, like maybe in a third register or something like that. Okay? So the whole purpose of this chapter is uh, the next chapter, we will get into a little bit of circuit design, although really just just the beginnings of it. Uh, but the whole purpose of this chapter is, is to get you to a point where you can kind of under, can, can see some of the details of the algorithms and the steps that are needed to implement these kinds of arithmetical operations, right? So, um, So let's start right with integer representation. So integer representations are simpler than um, floating point representations, somewhat. Um, but you know, lots of calculations are useful um, that we do with whole numbers. So ho hopefully everybody knows what we mean by an integer. It's a number without the fractional part, right? So so a whole number. Um, so, I mean, there, and there's two basic kinds of, of integers. Uh, so we'll work either with, with unsigned integers or signed integers, okay? So, so unsigned, we, we're only gonna be working with the positive integers, positive and zero. So, so usually for unsigned integers, we also represent zero and, and allow that to be used in our calculations, right? Um, or unsigned integers, so we can support both negative and positive uh, integers, right? So, yeah, so, so we're building on, we are building on our previous chapter on number systems. So um, um, we, we saw previously that um, we can represent numbers using a binary encoding with just ones and zeros, although there is a few other things we need for the representation that, that we didn't make explicit previously. So, I mean, you do have to have, you do have to represent a sign because numbers, uh, whole numbers or um, fractional numbers, uh, floating point numbers, can be positive or negative, right? Um, and, and often we want to work with negative numbers. So, so besides the representation we saw in the previous chapter, um, uh, we do have to have some way of representing the sign, whether the, the number is positive or negative. Uh, and the other, though, is the radix point, although, you know, uh, we, we use that in our representation in the previous chapter. So we have to have some way of knowing, basically, uh, for each digit in our representation, whether it's the two to the power of zero um, location or the two to the power of one, or if it's the other side of the, the radix point or the other side of the decimal point, it's two to the minus one digit or the two to the minus two digit or so on, right? Um, so let's start with um, unsigned integers, so, so non-negative integers. Uh, so, so these are unsigned and they're integers, so there's no fractional part. So in that case, these are, these are straightforward, okay? Um, you, can just in, you can just interpret the bits, however many bits you're using to represent your integer. Um, as the magnitude, as, as the unsigned value, all right? Um, and, you know, it's common to use 8-bit unsigned integers or 16-bit unsigned integers or 32-bit unsigned integers or even 64-bit unsigned integers, okay? And so the number of bits you use for your unsigned integer um, will determine the range of the value. So that, that's, that's true both for uh, integer values and floating point values. So, so the total number of bits you use in your representation is going to determine your range. Um, so eight bits, as we've talked about, and as you should understand at this point, is sufficient to represent 256 unique values. Um, or you know the values starting at zero. So if all the bits are zero, we interpret that as having a magnitude of zero up to 255. So, so if we have eight, eight bits and all bits are one, um, then that's 255. Um, 16 bits can represent values up to 65,530, um, uh, actually five, I think I forgot to subtract one from there. So it should be, yeah, it should be odd. So it should be 65,536 is two to the power of 16. 
but then the range of the value, the, the actual magnitude of the values you can represent for any uh, number of bit is two to the, that power minus one. So that should have been 65,535 there, right? 32, uh, again, I forgot, um, um, I should have subtracted one from both of those. So, um, so anyway, but, but yeah, so, so you can represent about 4 billion values in a 32 bit at about, uh, what is that, uh, 18, uh, whatever, um, this number of values in a uh, um, 64 bit uh, integer. So. Uh, but that is a limitation for any of these, you know, whenever, whenever you pick an unsigned integer of, of a particular size, if you need to, to represent values bigger than that, you can't do that with your representation. So as we'll talk about, you know, if you ever do a calculation that's too big to be represented, uh, you'll get overflow. Or, or, if you, or, or if you do a calculation that would result in a negative number, um, you would get a value that couldn't be represented with an unsigned integer anymore. So although that's still kind of an example of overflow in this case. Um, okay, and then let's let's talk about. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated um, if we want to represent actually signed numbers. So so values um, that can be positive or negative. Um, our book only talks about signed magnitude and two's complement. Um, one's complement is used some places, but I won't talk about that either. But but I encourage you if you're curious to look that up or look it up in Wikipedia. Um, so that sign magnitude is the simplest form of representation. Um, so to do that, you know, again, going back to what we talked about here, you know, um, so for integers, the, the, the radix point, the decimal point um, is assumed basically to be to the right of your rightmost digit, okay, be, because we have no fractional part all the, the, the rightmost digit is going to be the two to the power of zero digit. And then the, the second digit beside that is the two to the power of one and so on, right? So, so we have a um, assumed radix point, uh, but we need some way to represent the sign. Um, and since plus and minus can have two values, we can use a single bit, right? So and by convention, we use zero for positive. Uh, so, so most of the standards are going to define zero to mean a positive number and one to be a negative number. Okay. Uh, notice that um, uh, so this is sign magnitude. Um, so one thing about this before I go on, I mean, for an eight bit number, what that means is that um, you can still represent two hundred fifty five values, right? But um, the, the range then ends up being centered around zero, okay? So you re really only have seven bits to represent the magnitude. So the magnitude for an eight-bit signed integer uh, is using seven bits. So that has a maximum of 128 or, well, 127 actually, right? So that means you can represent values from negative 127 to positive 127 um, for the signed magnitude representation, right? And I um, can't remember if our textbook had a, a figure on that or not. Um, anyway. Um, So yeah, the, 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 the leftmost bit, the most significant bit is interpreted as the sign bit, and then the, the rightmost in minus one bits gives the magnitude. And so if, if you're using a 16-bit sign integer, then um, the, the range is going to be from negative one half of that, so negative 32,255 to positive uh, 32,760, uh, whatever that is. So. Um, and I'll notice for the sign magnitude that, that there's actually two ways to represent zero, which is kind of, I mean, for one thing, you know, you, there, there's one value, there's one less value in total that you can represent over the range, although that's not really a big deal. That's not the reason why we don't normally use sign magnitude. Um, it's, it's just that actually sign magnitude, um, it's very easy to perform the negation of sign magnitude. You just flip one bit, right? So if you if you need to 
uh, negate, so, so make a positive value negative or make a negative value positive, all you have to do for psi of magnitude is flip the, um, the sine bit, right? But most other operations, um, if you want to do them, like addition, subtraction, um, are usually harder to do um, using sine magnitude representative, harder than two's complement, um, as we'll talk about here. So, um, so for one thing, you know, it makes it harder to test for zero. You basically have to have a double circuit. So you have to test whether it's all zeros um, in the magnitude bits and a zero in the sine bit or all zeros in the magnitude bit and a one in the sine bit. So that's your two different um, representations of zero for sine magnitude. Right? Um, All right, so for reasons that uh, hopefully that you know you read about or read about, and then we'll, we'll discuss a little bit here. Um, most computer architectures are gonna actually be using two's complement representations for signed integers, okay? So first of all, what is two's complement or how's it work? Uh, basically, this, this is a, a, a slightly different method for um, representing um, values that are signed. Um, so uh, in two's complement, the, the most significant bit you can still interpret as a sign bit, okay? So like sign magnitude, if uh, we use one, we end up needing one bit um, to encode the, the sign, positive or negative, of our integer. Um, and the, the, the most significant bit, the leftmost bit um, is going to be you can interpret that basically as the sign bit for two's complement. So it'll be one um, if the value is positive, so if the value is negative, and zero if the value is positive. Okay. Um, and the value is positive, the, the, the other bits in the magnitude uh, are going to be encoded the same way as they would for sign magnitude. Okay. So for positive numbers, you really can't tell the difference between. Um, well, that's not true. So the, 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 the problem is, is that for an unsigned integer, you, you use all eight bits to represent the magnitude. So you can get a magnitude um, up to 256. But so for any value that's less than 128, uh, for unsigned, where, where the first bit happens to be zero, uh, that would have the same represent, representation as a two co two's complement um, signed value, um, you know, because again, the initial value would be zero, um, and then the other seven bits would give you the magnitude, right? Um, but um, so somewhere here, we, we talk about how you um, how you encode. Um, the, the a, a two's complement value. So basically, if it's negative, what we're going to do is we take the complement, okay? So in, instead of, uh, so, so you, you define the magnitude. So, so if you want to use seven, um, so I might be switching back and forth a lot today here, so, uh, if, uh, hopefully everybody can see that, but just real quickly, um, if, if you want to, let's say, um, implement, uh, uh, encode negative seven, I'm gonna be using that in a bit here. Um, if you wanna encode that as a Two's complement value. So, so the bit pattern for seven, for positive seven, is what? Uh, uh, you need one, one, uh, uh, zero twos, um, one, four, or, or um, a four, a two, and a one. So, so, so one, 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 right? So, so that gives you one plus two plus four. That, that's seven. Let's, let's just use um, four bits here, right? So, um, 
for one's complement, for two's complement, you just start by taking the, the complement of, of all the bits. So that would be one zero zero. And then you add one onto it. And that will give you the um, the two's complement rec, um, representation of your negative number. Okay. So, so this is going to be positive seven and negative seven and two's complement would be one zero zero one, right? So procedurally, just, just take the um, um, complement of the bits and add one to it, okay? Um, Conceptually, as, as it showed in our textbook, um, it's useful to um, think of this as, uh, where did it show that? Um, well, all the way down here, I'm skipping down to integer arithmetic, but, but yeah, if, if, if you think about that um, as a wheel of values for two's complement, right? So, so normally, so again, the, the, the leftmost bit will be your sign bit um, and all positive numbers would be encoded the same way um, as an unsigned integer, but for your negative numbers, um, all the values would be one. And uh, another way to interpret this is you can think of this as uh, if you have a one here uh, for, for using a, a four bit two's complement, you can think of this as representing a negative of two to that power. Okay, so negative two to the uh, four, um, or sorry, negative two to the three, or a negative eight, and then you add add in all these others. So one, one, one would be um, positive uh, seven, right? So negative eight plus seven gives you a negative one, right? And then one, one, zero would be a positive six. So negative eight plus six would give you a negative two, all right? So that, that's another way you can kind of interpret that. So, so think of that as adding the bit as usual, two to the zero plus two to the one plus two to the two, but then you're subtracting out the, the, the two's complement, the, the, the most significant digit, which is your sign bit, right? So, I mean, if that's zero, you're, you're just adding those up um, and adding up um, a zero for, you know, whatever your two to the third power, whatever your most significant power is. Um, and if it's, but if it's one, you're subtracting that from the result there. Um, all right, anyway, that, 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 that's how you um, procedurally, how you create a, a two's complement representation, right? So, so why would we do that? Um, so so here, here was kind of, again, the, the, the table from our textbook, a bit of a summary. So, you know, two's complement like, um, like the sign magnitude is basically going to support a range that's centered around zero. Um, although for, for a sign magnitude, if you think about it, basically you can go from negative two to the n minus one up to positive two to the n minus one, right? Uh, but for two's complement, uh, there's only one zero. So the only way to represent zero, uh, yeah, I probably should have left this up here to the, that wheel, um, is where all the bits are zero. That's your only zero. Um, and right, because of this encoding, um, we can actually represent um, the, the same as side magnitude. We can represent all the way up to, um, you know, uh, you know, so if we have four bits, this is two to the three, eight minus one. We can represent all the way up to that on the positive side, but we can actually represent all the way to negative eight on the, the uh, negative side. So, so there's not the minus one there. So, so in this case, for a four bit um, two's complement, we can act, we have actually uh, 16 unique magnitudes. So one negative one through negative eight and positive one through positive seven and zero. That, that sums up to a total of 16 magnitudes we can represent, right? Um, so yeah, as, as I think I already mentioned, the negation is a little bit more complicated for two's complement than sine magnitude. So um, all you have to do is, um, So, so for sine magnitude, all you have to do is flip the sine bit 
For two is complement to negate it. Um, you're going to have to take the complement of all the bits and then add one. The, the same procedure I just showed. So, so, so whenever you want to negate a two's complement number, complement all your bits and add one to the result, and you'll get. Um, so, so you know, again, um, um, you know, you know, you know, try it again. So, if you want to negate negative seven, uh, you'll you'll get back to positive seven. So, so if you just uh, complement all these bits um, and then add one plus one, you'll get the zero one one one, right? So, so that's the negation for two's complement. Um, Expansion of of the um, the value. So, for example, if I have an eight bit integer and I need to cast it into a sixteen bit integer, um, which is which is a pretty common thing to need to do. So, for sine complement, both of these are about equally hard. Sine complement versus two's complement. So, for sine complement, you just add zeros and then copy the the sign from the original position to the new most significant position. For two's complement, um, you just um, add, just add in, uh, you just copy the sign bit. Okay, so whatever is the, the, the leftmost bit, you just copy that over to all the new bits. All right. So that means that if I want my four bit uh, negative seven to become, or my four bit negative seven to become an eight bit. Um, I would copy these ones here. So, so the resulting um, eight bit expansion of uh, negative seven is that, okay? Um, So, and um, I think we'll get into some of the, the more advantages and disadvantages when we're comparing these two, when we talk about arithmetic here in a second. So we'll talk a little bit about how you implement addition and multiplication um, and subtraction, uh, things like that, and, and about overflow and, overflow and things, so. Um, Okay, so we talked about range extension. Um, all right, so at this point, I wanted to, to show a little bit um, in more details. If you've never done anything like this before using like C or something, um, um, it's a useful exercise. Here, let me put this over here. Uh, So, um, so let, let's 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 look at how you know um, let's look at how this actually works uh, in a real computer. Uh, uh, remember here, so um, um, I've got a little program and a bunch of code in here, so we can use it to about to. Um, examine basically the, the actual bit patterns in memory uh, for lots of things here, okay? So um, if you um, haven't programmed in C, I mean, uh, or, or um, probably everybody maybe has run across it a little bit, but if not, um, uh, C is a very good language for doing stuff like this because it's, um, um, it's built to be able to be closer to the metal, to the computer architecture, um, and, and, and potentially work with bits and things like that, okay? So if you've never seen the types in uh, C, uh, you know, so, so, so C is a type language, so you can have, you have characters and ints and floats, but for the, the newer standards, you have uh, Define data types that are more explicit in terms of the representation and the number of bits in the re representation, things like that. But let, let's start with the, the unsigned integer. Um, 
So a, a character is actually an unsigned integer, but if you know how characters, they, they represent ASCII encoded values, okay? Uh, but, but it's really one byte or eight bits. Um, and you can interpret it as an unsigned value. So, so for example, if we create a single character called X1 here, um, if you use the size of in C and C++, this returns the number of bytes. So the size of your data type in terms of bytes. So, so, so the, the X1 has one byte or eight bits, all right? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's characters are meant to hold ASCII encoded values. So if you stuff like a character uh, constant into X1, like A, um, it will actually use a bit pattern. Um, so so a, a numerical value is assigned to each of the lowercase and uppercase letters and numbers and things, right? You, you can look at the ASCII table. Um, so, so just Google ASCII table if you wanna find the value. So for A, um, if, if you get the, the character value out, you'll get uh, uh, A. But if you interpret this as an integer, um, as, an, um, as an int value, you'll see that it has the value 97. Okay, so, so decimal 97 is the ASCII code for a lowercase a in this case. All right? um, and if you look at the bits, um, it will be encoded like that. So this should be... Uh, what, uh, 64 plus 32 gives us 96 plus one is 97, the, the, the binary encoding of the decimal 97, all right? Uh, but to be more explicit, um, so you can, um, in C, you used to do something like use a, uh, called a short, um, Int so so uh, regular ints are usually thirty two bits in C. Uh, a short I can't remember if a short int would get you like a sixteen or an eight bit int. You know um, that's kind of because in some platforms you might get an, a sixteen bit int, in some platforms you might get an eight bit int. Um, um, that's kind of become less common to use that, although it's still supported in the language. Uh, but there are kind of these more explicit types like u int 8. Um, and I won't explain the T here, but, but this stands for we're, we're going to interpret x2 as an unsigned integer 8-bit uh, value uh, in this case, right? So again, this will be basically the same as the, the x1 character. So it'll have a size of 1. Um, so if, if you assign a value of 0 to it, as expected, you'll get all zeros uh, on the um, bit pattern um, if you display your bit pattern here. Uh, the maximum we can display, um, um, the maximum we can hold on an unsigned int is FF, right? Or 255, um, FF hexadecimal. Um, yeah, if you display the bit pattern of that, you'll get all ones, right? What happens if you overflow your, um, what do you guys think? If, if you overflow your uh, unsigned int, so let's say we assign 256 to x2, what would we get? Oh yes, yeah, so, okay, yeah, it's not even gonna let me compile it here because uh, it's detecting as a compiler a, an overflow error here. Um, I could probably cast it, tell it, um, yeah, I know what I'm doing even though I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. So what you'll get is uh, basically, you know, that the, you know, uh, 256 is, is a one followed by eight zeros. So this should wrap around, you know, overflow, but it'll wrap around back to the value zero, um, I think. So yeah, basically. Uh, same thing if you tried to assign like a negative value to, to an unsigned in. Um, so again, uh, negative one and two's complement is gonna be all ones, eight ones. So this will end up showing up as 255 if it doesn't give me a compiler error, if I have to cast it. Yeah, that, that, in that case, it didn't give me a compiler error. 
um, because negative one can be represented in eight bits uh, using two complement. Uh, but in this case, it, the bit pattern is all ones. So we should see that, yeah, in fact, if we assign that to x2, um, um, but then interpret it as the unsigned int, we get 255, or all ones. Right? Um, so let's look at the, uh, let's look at doing signed values um, in C, um, a signed 8-bit value again. So uh, again, if, if you look at a basic, um, unsigned or assigned int, so we don't put the u for unsigned. This will give us a signed integer value. Um, and you know, if we put zero in it, we'll get zero as expected, so eight zeros. If we put decimal 97 in there, we'll get 97. We'll get the same you know, um, bit pattern that we had when we put a in there, right? So again, to the computer, you know, this is just, um, you know, this is kind of, I don't know, I mean, this is, this is, this is basic, but but it, it's it's something that that a lot of people kind of don't think about a lot, right? So so the, the exact same bit pattern here in the one case we can interpret as a signed integer, so we get uh, a positive ninety seven decimal. Uh, but but you know that that same bit of memory or a different bit of memory could have a different bit pattern. But if we do an opcode or in any other way interpret that as a different data type, uh, like, a, like an ASCII character in this case, uh, we will you know, interpret that as you know, the particular ASCII character A for that same bit pattern. Right? So it's in the interpretation. So you know, I, I, can, I can load this into a register, um, and if I use um, an opcode that's doing some string manipulation, um, it would interpret that as an ASCII A. But if I use a lock code, it's going to be like an addition um, of signed integers that would interpret that as a signed 97, that this particular bit pattern, all right? Um, and then, you know, I mean, before you, before you look at this, so what would be, how would you represent negative 97? You have to complement all these bits and add one, so you get one, zero, zero, one, 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 and file zero, add one, you get that. So, and in, in fact, if you put a nine, negative 97 in here, so this is our first example though. I mean, we really are using two's complement. Um, and, and this is basically an, uh, uh, an Intel x86 um, 64 bit architecture machine, right? So um, we're using um, two's complement for signed values. Uh, and, and that's kind of showing that, that we get the bit pattern that, that we talked about that you would expect for a two's complement representation of that, right? Um, so I think um, um, I'm already taking too much time here, so I'll kind of skip over, but you know, you can look at, so 32-bit sign, unsigned and sign, it works the same way, but now we've got 32 bits and we can represent a bigger range. So zero up to the, um, um, uh, 4 billion. So values from zero up to a bit over 4 billion for the unsigned. So that's our maximum for the signed here, right? So notice, um, sorry, for, for the um, uh, for the unsigned 32-bit, um, if, um, If um, so I find my place. So um, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. So so there it is. Um, um, if we assign all ones, 32, 32 uh, ones, all 32 bits have ones, uh, we'll see our maximum, which is the two to the 32 minus one there, okay? Woo, woo. Um, and then, um, 
in fact, for the sign bit, you know, we, we show here that that um, uh, for our last two things on the, the sign 32 bits. Um, The, the maximum you can uh, maximum positive value you can assign is has a zero in the initial bit, and then all the other bits are one. That's what seven FFF basically gives you, right? Um, and if you want to find the the, the minimum value, um, that's basically a one with all zeros, right? So, so again, you know, if, if the if the that would give you the biggest negative value when the sign bit is one then it's going to be uh two to the it's going to be negative two to the 32 basically uh, or two negative two to the 31 so so that minus um zero so, so that that's where you get the negative uh, two thousand negative two uh, billion here so all right um so that that's basically it for um Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this uh, when we talk about the flow representations. Um, so that's the basics of the representation for signed and unsigned integers. So let's get back and talk a little bit more about the um, operation. So the common operations, we, we want to be able to negate um, signed integers. So we're mostly, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll skip over. Um, I mean, addition, is, is very simple for unsigned integers. Um, but yeah, once you start getting into subtraction or other things, then, then it becomes simpler to use signs of these two, two's complement represented uh, integers so uh, so anyway yeah we already talked about negation so uh, besides that we usually want to do addition subtraction and multiplication division um, so you know one of the reasons why two's complement is very useful for signed integers is that um, you can just treat the values as unsigned values and add the bits, all right? Um, so it makes addition a very simple, right? And how do you do subtraction using signed integers? Basically to do subtraction, you first negate the, the, um, the, the, the value that you're subtracting and then you do addition, okay? So subtraction is just addition with one extra step of negating the value that's being subtracted. So, so both of these end up being relatively simple to do for um, uh, for two's complement representation. All right. Um, so, uh, and and then um, whenever you're doing any computation. In a computer, you always have to worry about overflow um, and also underflow. Well, uh, well, we'll later talk about underflow, but for integers, um, it is possible to have this phenomenon called overflow. And, and you know, that it's relatively easy to understand the concept. I already talked about it. Anytime a calculation would result in a value that's too large to fit in our representation, um, then overflow occurs, okay? So again, so for uh, an unsigned integer uh, that, that's eight bits, the range of values is from negative 128 to 127. So if, if I do like an addition of two eight-bit unsigned integers and the result is bigger than 127 or smaller than negative 128, overflow occurs. I can't represent it anymore um, um, using an eight-bit representation, all right? So, so you can easily add two's complement numbers, just add up the bits like you normally would. But um, to, to check for overflow for addition using two's complement, um, uh, 
um, you basically have to do, and remember, this all has to be implemented as circuits, you know, as, as hardware um, circuit logic on, on the processor chip. So to implement addition, you know, you, you can just use a, an adder to add the bits. Um, and then you would have a, a step after that to check for overflow. Um, so the rule is that if adding numbers of the same sign, so originally I'm gonna have two unsigned integers, and if, if they were of the same sign, um, it's possible that, that they could have overflowed, been too big or too small um, to fit. But the way you check that um, is not that there's a carry bit. Um, so to do this addition, uh, uh, you um, might wanna have registers and also um, um, a, an extra register or an extra bit that can hold carry information. So at most, if you add or subtract two integers, you'll have one bit uh, of carry uh, in that case, right? But the way you check for overflow is that if you were adding numbers of the same sign, if the resulting sign bit, so if the, if the result in the sign bit ends up differing, then, then overflows occur. So, um, and this could be, it's not that if you have a carry bit or not, uh, which is something, you know, I admit if, before reading this chapter, um, I, that would have been my uh, answer right away. Well, you have a carry bit, that means you have overflow. But that's not quite it when you're doing two's complement. Uh, that, that's, that's really the rule if you're doing just sign magnitude. So, to, for example, to do addition for sign magnitude, basically, um, Um, assume both of the values are positive. You just add the bits, um, and then if you have a carry that that uh, that into the next bit, then then that's how you detect overflow for sign magnitude. So, um, so there, there was an example of this. Um, so like, you know, anyone make certain that that you. Um, understand that, but, but this was a good example. So if we want to, for example, add negative seven plus five in two's complement, again, just add the bit. So one plus one is zero, carry the one, then we have a one, 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 all right? So the result of negative seven plus five should be negative two, um, and this this is negative two if, if you decode this representation in, in base two, right? Um, but yeah, notice no overflow occurs. So, so notice our, you know, I'll just show our overflow cases here. Um, so in this case, if we're adding five and four, these are both positive. So notice though that the result is, uh, there is a carry bit in that case. Um, oh no, sorry, there's not. So this is four bits. So um, we don't end up with a carry case, but, but in this case, the, the sign bit was zero. So if, if you add five and four, um, the result is nine, right? But this isn't nine in two's complement. Um, this is um, eight minus um, negative eight plus one. So this is negative um, seven that, that we already showed here, right? Um, so again, the, the way that you detect overflow here is that the sign bits were the same, and if the resulting sign bit ends up being different, overflow occurred, right? So this was actually, you know, the, high, the, the largest value you can um, represent in four bits uh, for two's complement is positive eight. And so if you add five and four, that's a little bit too big, um, and you can detect overflow because the, the, the sign bit was different from the... the the two sign bits of the calculation track. So again, you'd have to implement that as um, logic in your circuit. A after you did the addition, just using an adder to get the, the bits, uh, then you do a check. Okay, if the sign bits were the same, um, and then the, the new sign bit is different, then overflow occurred. Right? But here overflow occurred even though no carry occurred. Uh, and here if we're adding negative seven and negative six, the result should be negative 13. Um, um, and that would be like negative 13. Um, uh, but, but, but anyway, so, but, but here, again, it's not that we have the, the carry bit. So, so here we have one bit more, you know, so, so these were five bits and we can't fit the result anymore um, in, in our four bits here. But the real 
way to detect overflow is that we were trying to add two negative values, but the result ended up having zero in the, um, the sign bit again. So, so again, overflow occurred um, in this case here. Um, All right, so yeah, and I already talked about subtraction. So, so using two's complement, basically, um, you just have the extra step of um, negating the sub, uh, negating the subdrahen, which is the, the number that you're subtracting, basically, and adding it to the other one. Then, so. um, Okay, um, and um, yeah, I wanted to work through an example on the two's complement multiplication. So um, let me go through that here because I also want to take a break in a little bit, uh, but, but uh, I think I'm going to try and work through this first because I had a lot of stuff I want to talk about floating point representations as well here. Um, so we looked at addition and subtraction using two's complement mostly. Um, so normally um, we also implement multiplication. Um, oh, I skipped over something I meant to mention. Um, uh, here's another interesting thing. If, um, if you're interested in computer architectures. Um, so the thing to understand is that basically what you will find in the instruction set for computer architecture are a lot of different instructions for you know, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, also logical operations, greater than, less than, comparisons, things like that. Um, so just looking at multiply, um, so this isn't all the multiply instructions in the x86 64-bit uh, instruction set, but uh, you know, there's a, there's one for multiplying unsigned numbers. Um, and, and I believe these are like unsigned 8-bit numbers. And then there's the corresponding multiply for signed 8-bit um, numbers. And then there's multiply um, S for single precision. Um, so, so for multiplying 32-bit signed numbers, um, most likely. Um, and then multiply D for multiplying 64-bit sign numbers. So I'm sure that there's probably a, a corresponding I mall. I don't know why I didn't pull them out, but, but there's probably unsigned versions of both of these as well. So, so that's basically the way you invoke the logic for doing these arithmetical operations that we're talking about here. You know, you, you put the values that you want to multiply or whatever in particular registers, then you call um, the uh, appropriate instruction, um, and it will interpret the bit patterns in those, you know, as integers or floats or whatever. Um, so for multiplication, um, multiplication is certainly more complex than division. Um, so think about it. So um, if, if you if you were multiplying um, um, two unsigned numbers, so, so two binary in integers, um, you can do that relatively easy, doing basically the same kind of procedure that you would do that you learned from longhand multiplication um, sometime way back in grade school, probably, right? Um, but imagine, um, so, so, so to do that, uh, in computer circuitry, though, you know, so, so you, you basically, if I want to multiply um, 13 times 11, so again, these are unsigned four bit values here. Um, but I can do that in longhand. So, so one times that would be that. So zero times that is just going to be zero. But, but notice one times that is that. And then notice you shift that off. So, you know, think, think what this means shifting here. So, you might not have thought about this for a long time, you know, since you had to do long multiplication by hand. But shifting, um, if, if you're doing this in decimal, is because you're multiplying the instead of the ones digit, you're multiplying the ten, ten, tens digit times that, right? So zero times the tens digit. 
is going to be zero. But one times that, if this was base 10, would be the hundreds digit. So that's why you shift it over, because there's implied zeros here. So you're doing the same thing. You can do the same thing in binary representation, shifting. Another thing that, that is good to understand is when you shift values to the left, um, binary values, that's the same as multiplying by two for the same reason that shifting in base 10 is the same as multiplying by 10, okay? Uh, but yeah, anyway, you could do that and, and multiply and, and add that up. Um, and that, that would be how you would implement the um, circuit logic for unsigned integer multiplication. Um, so notice what you'd have to do. You have to do um, a bunch of, basically, anytime the value is a one, you do a one, you, you'd probably want to do it. Uh, this is the way that we're going to do it down here. So you would probably have something that accumulates the results. So, so you would first start with your accumulator as all zeros. Every time you have a one, you would just add that in. Okay, so add one, zero, one, one to, to the, the initial accumulator of all zeros. So the result is one zero one one, and then uh, and then you would shift this over. Um, no, sorry, um, you would leave that. Um, but 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 yeah, then then you would multiply by zero. But anytime you multiply zero, you can just skip because you're not going to be adding anything in there. Then we but I would add we'd have to uh, add in one zero one one. But first we would shift one zero one one um, two places here. And then we would add that to here, right, and so on. So that would be kind of the basic thing. You, you'd be doing a sequence of shift and adds. Um, so um, either add or you skip the add part um, and, and then just shift um, and do your add. Okay. That, that's kind of a, a very basic description of what the circuit would look like for you. And, and you have to do sort of um, the number of bits in your representation would be the number of shift add cycles. So think about that. That you would need that number of cycles for every multiplication in your CPU pipeline, right? So, so normally an add or subtract probably just takes one cycle, but multiplication uh, is maybe going to need cycles depending on the number of bits um, in your um, values, basically. Um, so the whole point of this, if, if you did the reading closely or, or when you do the reading closely on this chapter is that, um, you know, this actually works to implement in circuit logic uh, for unsigned integer multiplication, but this, this won't work if you're using two's complement signed values, right? Um, So for two's complement multiplication, um, you, you know, I mean, basically, especially for negative numbers, these bits don't represent, you know, the, the, their complements, right? So, so you can't just use kind of the straight, straightforward um, grade school long multiplication to do that. Um, So, um, so I'm just going to skip to it to because uh, I want to work through one example uh, real quick here. Um, so instead, but, but you can come up with algorithms. Um, uh, you can do it sort of in a longhand way, but. Uh, lots of extra steps or extra work is required. So, so the idea of, of this algorithm called Booth's algorithm for um, uh, for multiplication of two two's complement signed numbers, um, it, it's an algorithm that um, takes approximately the same amount of work as multiplication for sign uh, for unsigned numbers, right? Um, so, so the amount of work ends up being comparable. Uh, to the um, unsigned case, but 
when we're multiplying two sign numbers uh, that are encoded using two's complement. And that's what the boost algorithm is. So this is a flow chart of it. Um, and this is really clever. Um, um, if um, I don't know, there's there's a slight um, attempt to explain what Booth's algorithm is doing uh, in detail. I don't know if it's completely um, necessary that you understand the details here. Maybe once I do this, um, I'll, I'll make a quick attempt at doing this. Um, but if you just look at the algorithm um, and, and then just see or understand that, that yeah, if you follow this procedure, uh, it will correctly um, result in giving you a multiplication of two signed two, two's complement numbers, okay? Um, so the general procedure is this, and um, I, I mean, I'm basically gonna recreate this, but I'm gonna use, um, I think I'm gonna use, Um, one of the other examples here. So we get a slightly different result, like, like seven times negative three here, okay? Um, so, um, So first of all, let, let's. Um, we wanna, I'm going to try and um, demonstrate multiplying uh, seven times negative three here. Okay, so our numbers are going to be um, seven and negative three. So seven times negative three. Right. So first of all, you know we have to encode these as um, two's complement, right? So I didn't come up seven, um, um, and we'll use four bits like they did. So we use a, a four bit. Um, Two's complement encoding here. Right? So seven, uh, we already saw is zero, one, one, one. So that's two to the zero plus two to the one plus two to the two. Um, four plus two plus one gives seven. Uh, three um, is um, zero, zero, one, one, right? Uh, well, positive three is zero, zero, one, one. So that's two plus one because it's three. Two's complement, though, is then going to be one, one, zero, zero plus one. So negative three would be um, one one zero one encoded as two's complement. Okay. So um, as the, the as the textbook said, what you do is is we're gonna you know, so these would be like registers defined in in um, the processor. So we're gonna use an accumulator, so some register to accumulate the result of the multiplication. Okay? And one thing I forgot to mention is that you know so for addition. The, the result of, of adding or subtracting two numbers is always going to be like, like it's going to be if I'm adding or subtracting two four bit numbers, the result is going to be four bits or possibly five bits. So there could be a carry. So, so the result will fit always in either n or n plus one bits. OK, when you're multiplying, the result is going to fit in um, possibly in the original in bits. So, so it could be that it fits in the four bits and doesn't overflow, but at the most, it could need twice as many bits. So you could need uh, two times the number of bits in. So, or, so eight bits if we're doing four bits here, right? So that means that, that to get the full result, if we have a four bit number, I need eight bits. And so we, what we do is we use an accumulator um, and the, we initialize the accumulator to zero, kind of like I talked about for the um, unsigned multiplication, if you're trying to do it using an accumulator. Um, and then we use two other registers, two other um, registers, uh, Q, which is where we put the, um, the, the, the multiplier, so the negative three here. Um, so we want the value 0, 1, 1, 1. So this, the reason why we put this in here is we're, we're going to be shifting this. So that represents, like when I was doing the multiplication by longhand, that represents um, the, the, the shifting by 10 whenever we're doing the next digit in the multiplication by, by, by longhand, all right? So, so here we would initialize this by 0, um, sorry, 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay. 
for the, the negative three. Uh, we have, uh, we need an additional bit um, to shift things on into. So again, this would have to be somewhere um, in our circuit logic uh, to hold this bit when we do the shifting and we initialize that to zero. And then the other, other register that, that our textbook called M holds the, the, the multiple kin, so, so the, 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 the seven in this case, the other number. All right, um, so I'm basically kind of going by the, the, the flow chart um, here at, at the top, um, you know. So again, this would make a good, to me, it would make a good um, comprehensive exam question. If I gave you the flow chart, um, So, so, you know, if you have this flow chart and I described that this was, you know, two's complement multiplication um, and described maybe in words, you know, what, what this means here. So this means you, you initialize the A um, and the Q minus one register is supposed to zero. You put the multiple can in the M register, the multiplier in the Q register, um, and you're going to perform in cycles here. So whatever the bit size is, the number of bits in our representation in, we're going to do that in time. So, so we repeat this um, until count is zero, right? So, so basically we're going to be decrementing our count here, right? Um, so for the, um, the, the first cycle, so, so by the flow chart, basically we start off by comparing these two things, okay? So if these two bits are equal, then um, we don't have to do any adding, okay? So this is similar to multiplying by zero that, I, that, that we did on the first one with the unsigned values. But in this case, if, if the two values are the same, um, we don't need to add or subtract anything to our accumulated result, all right? But here, if it's one zero, we're gonna do a subtraction, okay? So, so for our first cycle, we're doing um, a one zero, that implies we need to do a subtraction. All right, so A, the accumulator is going to get the result of adding um, accumulator subtract M, okay? So again here, the, the thing in order to understand um, the, um, how the boost algorithm works and like the figure 10.13 uh, and figure 10.14, uh, you have to realize that, that you know, that this is two's, two's complement subtraction here, okay? So what we want to do is we want to take, uh, um, a, which, which currently holds 0, 0, 0, 0, and subtract M. But to subtract M, we're just going to take the, the negative. We're going to negate M and then add it. So, so first we need to negate M. Um, so that becomes 1, 0, 0, 0, and add 1 to that to negate the 2's complement. Then we add those. And that, then that result gets put into the accumulator, right? Um, and then all these are going to be the same for this first step. This is the first half of the first cycle. So we'll just keep the, so all the rest of the registers will remain the same. And then for every cycle, whether you do an add or subtraction, then you're always going to do a shift. Okay. So now what you do is you shift um, all the bits in A and Q and Q minus one down. Okay, so uh, it, it, the, and and uh, so when you do that, the, there's no bit here. So you you copy the, the, the most significant bit in A here. So so in this case, we're going to leave one here and copy one down. Okay, um, and then uh, whatever's in the Q minus one just falls in the bit bucket. So so it it, it it shifts out. Okay, so shifting these down, this becomes one, and then you know the the zero zero one shifts. Here, this one shifts over to here, and then the one zero zero shifts here, and then, like I said, uh, what gets shifted in is a copy of what was there before. All right. So, if you look so far, this was actually the same as when we did seven times positive three. Okay, so that was our first cycle. Um, then for cycle two, um, again, we compare these. Um, so here, now, whenever the things are um, 
um, equal, uh, we're just going to do a shift. So, so we don't have to do any adding or subtracting um, in this case, right? Um, Uh, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm. I just realized. If anybody, whenever, if 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 you know, feel free. If if you notice me doing something, or if you think you notice me doing something wrong, speak up. Yeah, I, I was just recreating the, the textbook here, so I was wondering why. Um, there should have been something slightly different, but but um, I, I was I was multiplying seven times three. I didn't put negative three in there, so let me go back redo step one. So negative three is one one zero one. Okay. Um, so we still have. Um, one zero, um, and and we still have the result of when we subtract zero minus m, we still get the same thing in there, but um, when um, let me reshift those. When we shift those, um, you know, we're, we're going to have a, 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 another difference here. So, um, which is why step two should have been different. It is going to be different than, than the um, example of seven times three. Uh, and our one will shift down here and then one, zero, zero. And then we still have the one shift there. And hopefully I'm drawing big enough so you can tell the differences between my ones and zeros here. So. All right. So, yeah, continuing on. So, so now, um, we actually end up with um, values that that differ between uh, q zero and q minus one here, right? Zero and one. So by the flow chart of Booth's algorithm, um, if you have zero one, we're going to do an addition instead. Doctor Harder. Yeah. Is that 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 blue line you put there? Should it be one one zero zero? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, it should be. Just can't see my one very well. So yeah, one one zero zero one 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 zero. Unless I made another mistake. Okay. Um. All right. So now we're going to do an add instead of subtract. So notice, I mean, this is a little bit different from the 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 kind of doing by hand for the um, uh, unsigned integers. So sometimes you can subtract. Sometimes you can add. You're always going to be adding to the accumulator on the other one. Um, so here again, and again, notice we're always just either adding M or subtracting M um, into the accumulator. So in this case, we want to add in uh, the, um, the accumulator now has the one, one, zero, zero at this point, uh, plus zero, one, 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 right? There, I should have done that longhand, so. Zero one one one. Um, so again, so since this is two's complement, we can just add add the bits as if treating them as if they're unsigned. Um, so you get one 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 plus one gives you a zero with a one carry. One plus one gives you a one again. Uh, it gives you a zero with a one. So notice that we end up with a carry bit. Um, if if that happens, you can you ignore the carry bit. For this case here, so, so you just take that. That becomes your new accumulator value for the, the Booth algorithm, right? Um, so the result is going to be zero zero one one. Um, oops. And make certain I copy the right stuff down. So, um, so you know th these are the current values in each of our registers. So everything else besides the accumulator is going to be the same now for the second part of um, our cycle two. Um, and that, and then we do a shift. So you always do a shift. So doing our shift again. Um, this doesn't shift, but but these 
two registers and that extra bit participate in the shift. So we get the zero, we get one, 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 and we get one shifted down here, we get zero, zero, one. And then again, so here, um, since we had a zero, uh, a, a, a copy of the zero gets shifted in um, on the left here, all right? Um, all right, and I'm just gonna complete these off because I wanna take a little a break here though, and, and we'll see if we get the correct result or not. Um, so again, we had a, a one zero, so that, that indicates a subtraction needs to happen. Um, so I guess A gets the A minus M. So the, I mean, the same thing, well, you know, I know that we need to um, add, you know, the negation of M. So, so we'll be doing the same thing, but to the current value of the accumulator, which is um, zero, 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 001 here. So the result of that is gonna be what? Uh, um, zero, carry the one, we end up with one here, and then a zero and a one, one, zero, one, zero, if I did that right. Um, and then we'll do our shift. Um, so we get one in here. Um, and we get, uh, And again, we're shifting in a, a one on the leftmost bit since we had that there, okay? So, um, and then finally, um, last step, we've got a, a one, one. So this, this uh, we don't need to do an addition or subtraction again. Um, we just need to do a shift operation. Um, So we should end up with one down here. Zero one one, uh, and this one goes here. We get one one zero, and a one up here. All right. Um. All right. So let's check. So so seven times three should be. Negative 21, right? So negative 21, um, we need to represent this as eight bits. So, so first of all, um, our plus 21 magnitude uh, would be what? We would need like a 16. So, so two to the four um, gives us a six, 16 plus, uh, plus not eight. That would, that would be, uh, give us 24, that'd be too much. So no eight, so 116, no eight, um, a four to give us 20, no zeros, and a one. So that's one plus four plus 16, which gives us the 21. Um, and again, so, so, so this would be in five bits. So, If that was plus 21, our, our, our eight bit representation would be that with all zeros here, right? So the, the, the ones complement of that for the negative 21, which is the result we're, we're expecting, should be complement all of our bits and add one, right? And hopefully, if we did everything right, we should see. Um, that um, that is indeed what you know you get for the final thing here one 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 zero one zero one one. So this is negative twenty one um, in two's complement, which should have been the result of our calculation seven times minus three. Right. Um, so here are some things to talk about. So yeah, again, this is an example. You know, we have overflow here. So um, if we're using four bit signed values. 
um, we can only represent values up to, you know, uh, plus or minus seven, basically, plus seven and minus eight, right? Um, so there's no way this is going to fit in here. So yeah, in this case, you know, you can you can detect um, overflow. Um, I guess in various ways. I don't remember if our book talks about it for multiplication, but um, but yeah, if, uh, but again, if if we don't end up with like um, um, or, or if we end up with bits um, in uh, up here. Um, anything non-zero up here, that, that's probably overflow for our um, sign multiplication. So, um, all right. Oh, and, and one final quick thing, and then I want to take a five minute break, um, but um, I'm gonna have to erase this here, so. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the figure 10.14, if you look in your textbook, then shows a, a slightly different representation of the same calculations. Um, I kind of want to explain that. So at first hand, if, if you read through this quickly, uh, you know, that again, might look like it's just doing a uh, longhand multiplication, right? But that's not exactly the case. So this, this is a slightly different way of representing the same calculation that happens. So, so let me just kind of um, 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 say what's going on on that. In fact, I think I'll just, uh, I don't think I'll write it out again. I'm just going to um, go back to the textbook here. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, we're, we're multiplying, we're, we're representing um, multiplying two's complement numbers. So um, as we already, stated, you can't just do simple uh, grade school longhand multiplication here. So that, that's not what's being represented here, even though, so this is representing kind of doing the boost algorithm, right? So basically, if you look at this, um, so if we have a, a one dash zero, um, you'll notice that um, um, What's being showed here is is this is this is supposed to be the result, just the result in the accumulator, but over eight bits. Okay, so the result in the accumulator after the first cycle, before we did the shift, um, was um, one zero one in four bits, but in eight bits you you'd have to remember the extension. You'd have to extend the ones. Okay, so that represents the. Um, result in the, the accumulator after this first cycle, four ones and then the one zero one, right? Um, and then on the, the second step, um, it's the, the, I mean, you can tell that it's a one zero because um, again, you have to, to think of the, 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 the Q zero bit here. Um, so you have to have a zero, oh, the, the Q minus one bit here. So, so for the first cycle, we were comparing one to the zero. For the second one, then we're comparing this bit to this bit. Because remember, here we, we shifted those down. So now, after we did the shift, when you're doing that comparison of Q0 and Q to the minus one, that would be like comparing these two bits. Okay. So that's one, one. Um, and in that case, so the same, we don't do, we just do a shift. Okay. So we have a zero. Um, Dr. Harder? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm I'm a little confused about what I'm saying. On the first, on the initial values, uh -huh. where you had you had a minus uh, m on the first one. On the right. third cycle, you did a plus m. Right. Is it because of the the accumulator values? The, the lead? Uh, whether you're doing a subtraction or addition depends solely when you compare these two bits. So so here, since it was one in Q zero and zero in Q minus one, one zero, that implies, that, that, that means you need to do subtraction for Booth's algorithm, right? So it's again, that's, that's what the, the flow chart means here. So you compare Q zero and Q minus one, if it's one zero, so one in Q zero and zero in Q minus one, you're gonna do subtraction. 
And if it differs, but it's zero, one, you're going to do an addition. Okay? And if they're the same, one, one, or zero, zero, you don't do an addition or subtraction, you do a shift. All right. Okay. Right. So, so that, that, so since it was one, zero, we did a subtraction. Since, um, um, actually it was one zero here so at, at the end of this this first this cycle it was one one so since it's one one that's where you have to look so here to, to determine whether you're shifting or what or subtracting or adding you look at the end result from the previous cycle so since it was one one that means we don't subtract or add we just shift um, and then the result of that was zero one so since it's zero one um, we're going to do the add and since this is zero zero, um, we do neither. We just shift again. Okay, thank you. Right. And and the way you determine that from this representation, uh, that one zero one one or zero one, you know, again, basically you're looking at the subsequent bits. So, so this shifting when you're doing it longhand like that is is so the first cycle I'm looking at one and the q minus one bit, so one zero. The second cycle, when I'm uh, I'm basically multiplying this one here, or when I'm processing the one digit, but but in that case, it's one, and the adjacent dig uh, digit is one, so it's one one. Then for this third cycle, it's zero one. So in that one, we're going to add instead of subtract. And then on the third cycle, there's a didn't they didn't show the third one um, on this one here, but um, so. Or sometimes they, they dropped out. There should have been four for all these, but, but sometimes they dropped out when the um, when it was all zeros, I think, here. Right? But anyway, I have to go back and look at those. Um, so here for this third one, we're just shifting. It, it, it's um, for, for this one, we're just shifting. Um, oh, oh, they dropped it out anytime it was just a shift. So, so you really don't have to show anything if it was just a, a shift. Uh, and then this fourth one, though, again, um, so here we were adding into the accumulator while we're doing things. Here we're not doing this. So, so the, 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 the way to understand what happens here is that think of the accumulator or think of it as, as that we're just adding. So since we're doing an add here, just add um, the, the, the 0, 1, 1, 1 to 0. So 0 plus this gives 0, 1, 1, 1. Um, and since that's a positive number, again, all of the, 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 the rest of the values for the sign bit are just 0. Okay, So that's why this is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, because we just added 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 to, to 0. All right. So, so here we did a subtract. So for all of these, whenever you do an add or subtract, it's going to be the um, uh, adding 0, you know, subtracting this from zero or adding that to zero. And then the way you do the accumulation is just to add by hand. So then if you add up all these by hand, um, you should get the um, same final result um, that they had, right? So, so that was for the seven positive seven times positive three. And, and like we had, you should get the same result for positive seven times negative three. Um, All right, um, and the reason why you do the add and, and the, the subtract is talked a little bit about here. And I don't think it's crucial that you completely understand that, but, but it basically has to do with this argument that when you have a string of ones, um, you can do this mathematical manipulation um, and then you can kind of simulate, you can skip over the whole string and then you can just um, kind of add in one of these, um, so add in the, the big one and subtract the smallest from the string here, right? It gives you the equivalent, so. Um, all right, and, and you know, I'll leave division to you guys reading on your own. So, so let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and look at floating point representation. So it's 8.55, so we'll come back at nine. And I'll try to keep it about to 45 minutes, I think, but um, all right.
Um, okay, I'm back. Um, hopefully everybody's ready to, to um, start up again. Um, so yeah, still try and keep this a little bit briefer. Um, although you know, there, there's a lot of good stuff here on on the uh, uh, the floating point representation. So up to this point, we've talked about um, just integers, so so whole numbers, uh, both signed and unsigned. Okay. Um, So, so in, in our integer representations, the, the radix point, um, as I mentioned, is implicitly after the, the rightmost digit, okay? So since there's no fractional part, the, the, the decimal point um, is, is to the right of the rightmost, rightmost digit, which represents two to the zero. So that means that the, that the least significant digit is always the ones place or the, the two to the zero. The next most significant is the uh, two to the ones place or the, the twos place and so on, right? Um, so we can use basically, um, well, our, you know, our, our first idea for representing a floating point number is we could just move the, 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 the decimal point, okay? So we could do something like say the last two digits um, are actually the fractional parts, the two to the minus one and the two to the minus two. So, so like if I was using eight bits to re represent a float, I could use two bits for the fractional parts um, and then um, the other six bits uh, for the, uh, the whole number part or the, the, the part uh, before the decimal, right? Um, so this has limitations of very large and very small fractions can't be represented. Um, and uh, when you're doing calculations, if you do that in this kind of this very simple way of representing uh, floating point numbers, um, it's tougher to keep the fractional parts of the quotients when you do division uh, and other things, okay? So th there are various, various reasons why we use a slightly more complicated uh, representation for floats. Um, So the representation, the IEEE 754 standards for floats, um, which is kind of what we're basically talking about or working our way up to, um, uses kind of the same idea as what we use for scientific notation. And, and, and kind of intuitively, uh, one of the reasons why, you know, it can be hard to work with very large numbers, um, is because you know if you do this um, to represent really large numbers, you end up having need lots and lots of digits, but lots of them could be zero or, or really not significant, right? So if you're not, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody knows kind of the basics of what scientific notation means. You know? So we can represent very big or very small numbers using scientific notation, where we use just the, the most significant bits most significant digits um, and then also we specify the power okay so in this case uh, 976 um, quadrillions I guess um, is um, uh, 9.76 times 10 to the 14 so, so you know if you move the decimal place 14 positions to the left it comes here or in other words, if you took 9.76 and you multiply it by 10 to the 14, you would get the same number back here, the same big, large number here. So. You can do the same thing for very small numbers as well. So, so here we've got you know, 13 zeros before our, our, our uh, significant digit nine. Um, so we have 9.76 times 10 to the minus 14. So. Um, so the, the, the big advantage and why it's used by scientists, scientific notation, um, is we can, we can represent large, very large and very small numbers without having to have lots and lots and lots of digits, uh, and especially like lots and lots and lots of zeros for really small numbers here, which you know, makes it pretty much like unreadable. To, you, know, you, have, you have to end up counting up the number of zeros here to, to get a sense of what this is. But here it's immediately 
you know, scientific notation, it's immediately clear whether you're talking about, you know, 10 to the minus six, so millionths, or 10 to the minus ninth, which is billions, or, or, or kind of what the magnitude is of, of the number that you're getting at. So that, that's, that's we're, we're basically using this same idea to represent floats. That's what the IEEE 754 standard um, defines. Um, so we need actually, um, um, we still need a sign bit, okay? So we're actually back to using sort of a sign magnitude um, here. So, so we just have a single sign bit um, and then the magnitude represented by the significant S and the exponent e. Um, it's, so those two things will give us a magnitude. And if the sine bit is one, then it's a negative number. And if the sine bit is zero, then it's a positive number. Okay. But anyway, so, so we we these things what we'll call the significant. This used to be called the mantissa, but um, that's um, um, kind of. Uh, People, people don't do that anymore because mantissa has a couple of different other meanings. So significant actually makes more sense here. Th those are the significant bits uh, of, of our number that we're representing here. Um, and then the base, um, so for the IEEE 754 standard, you, you can define, you can use different bases if you wanted to. We, 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 we normally use two as the base. So, so for scientific notation, we use 10 as the base. Um, but, but for all the floats that we're going to be using, they're represented in the computer using two. So using a base two here, right? But that doesn't add, so there are some IEEE 754 standards that use 16 as the base instead of two. So it doesn't have to be two. Um, it could be 10. Uh, but, but yeah, we, 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 use, we use two for the most common floating point um, standard. So since it's always two, you don't have to, to keep what the base is. So, so, so for most all of these standards, we, um, depending on what standard we, we're using, we know what the base is. So the only thing you need to keep is the significant and then the exponent, okay? So in our standard, uh, we're gonna have some bits that represent what the exponent is two to, to some power. So again, this is base two. So it's, two to whatever power, and then some more bits to represent the significant, okay? So for the, um, for the, um, the IEEE basically has uh, three main um, floating point standards defined, but they're basically for 32-bit, 64-bit, and 128-bit floats that use, a, use two as the base for the floats, okay? So I'll, I'll mostly today, pretty much exclusively be talking about 32-bit floats. Um, so for 32-bit floats, we use, basically, we have to have one bit for the, the sign still. And then the other 31 bits, we use eight bits to represent an exponent, um, and then 23 bits to represent the significant, okay? Now we need to be able to represent positive and negative exponents. Um, so, um, so, so I mean, we could use, for example, a, a you know two's complement, two's complement, like we were just talking about, to represent sign numbers, right? And and again, uh, so I, you know, I'll ask you guys. So, since we have eight bits, um, and if we're using a signed representation here, what are the possible exponents, range of exponents that we can represent? It's basically down here in our textbook. So again, like for the two's complement, uh, we can represent exponents essentially from negative 127 to positive 127 or 128, right? Um, if, if we were using two's complement, we could represent exponents from negative 128 to positive 127, okay? We use uh, the, the IEEE 754 uses, um, uh, 
uh, what's called a biased representation. So it's similar. Um, and don't ask me why they didn't use two's complement. I'm, um, I'm sure, uh, and, and our textbook maybe touches on it. Um, I'm sure there's a performance reason for it, but um, so 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 we use a slightly different representation, although it's it's pretty similar. Basically, the biased representation. Um, you just subtract a, a, a fixed value from, so, so if, you, if you interpret this as a magnitude, it's like an unsigned magnitude, but then you subtract the bias, that's gonna be um, how the, the exponent is interpreted, okay? And the bias is gonna be two to the K minus one, okay? So, so again, if we have eight bits, we're gonna subtract, the, the bias will be two to the seven minus one, uh, two to the seven is on 28, so basically we subtract 127, okay? So since the maximum value is 255, so the minimum value would be zero if you interpret that as unsigned. So zero minus 127 gives you the, the minus 127 on the negative end. Um, and then the maximum value you can represent is 255 using eight bits um, unsigned. So 255 minus 127 gives 128. So that, that's why the range comes in there. Um, and then one other thing to understand about the normal number. So again, these, these are all going to be bits on the significant. Okay. So we, we always represent floats uh, normalized. Uh, so this normal number. So no, normalized means. So for base 10, like we did here, normalize means that um, the first digit before the decimal point is gonna be non-zero, but only that. So, so normally for when we normalize scientific notation, I could have norm I could have represented this as 97.6 times 10 to the minus 15, but that wouldn't be normalized uh, as a decimal scientific notation. So to normalize it, we only have one digit uh, that's non-zero to the left of the decimal place, right? 9.76. So, so that means that the, the normal scientific notation for this number has to be represented as 9.76 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay. So you can, you can do the, the same thing for, um, so for binary numbers, but since the digit always has to be zero and one, um, and since it has to be non-zero to be normalized, you know that if you normalize a binary scientific notation number, uh, the digit before the radix point has to be one, okay? So since it always has to be one, we actually don't have to keep that in the significant. But the, so so the, the one is implied, but it, but it is in there. So when, if you interpret these bits like this, like we're talking about it, you have to remember that, that it's a one point and then these binary digits represent the other um, significant bits of our scientific notation represented binary number here. All right. Um, so yeah, this is this is a very important figure here. Um, so I think we're ready to discuss this. Um, so make sure you understand this. So for, for two's complement integers, um, it's relatively simple. We can represent, so for example, um, this is like a 32-bit integer using uh, signed two's complement, means that we can represent integers in the range from negative two to 31 up to positive two to 31, minus one, right? Uh, but we, we only represent you know, the whole numbers, you know, so zero, one, two, three, up to, you know, uh, 30, you know, you know, whatever two to the 31 is. So. so because the exponent can range from basically negative 127 to 127 or negative 127 to 128, that means that, that the, the, the values they can represent with, with our, Define floating point standard, you know, ranges from, you know, the, the negative, let's do the positive numbers first. So the positive numbers can range from very small. So positive two to the minus 127 is something with like 127 zeros before the first significant binary digit, right? 
up to um, to the 128, basically, right? Um, but you know, I mean, there's an infinite num infinite number of values between zero and two to the minus 127. Uh, because this is a real value number line, okay? So there's really actually, again, you can't represent anything smaller than that smallest theoretical value, right? So that, that's the positive underflow gap, right? And of course, you can't represent, for a 32-bit float, you can't represent a number bigger than basically 2 to the 128, okay? So it's not exactly 2 to the 128. So, so if you have 2 to the 128, if you have 128 as the exponent, and then if you have all the significant bits as one, it's a little bit bigger than, than uh, you know, one times. It's basically nine times, 9.99 uh, uh, times two to the 128, right? So that's why it's a little bit more than that, right? Um, Right, and you get the same thing for the other end, um, um, just for the negative. So, so your biggest negative number is basically negative two to the one twenty to the one twenty eight, and your smallest negative number is negative two to the negative one twenty seven. All right. Um, So yeah, if, if, if the calculation results in a value that's too small to be represented, if it's a positive number, we, we can, you could call that positive underflow. For either of those is just underflow if it's too small to be represented. Um, and either of these, so overflow means it's, you know, it, so, so these, these numbers are a lot smaller than these numbers. So it's not the, the, the magnitude, it's, you know, it, it's um, 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 too big of, of of a negative magnitude or too big of a positive magnitude to, to be represented by an exponent of 128. Okay. Um, another thing to, 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 to note is that there's actually, we're back to, there's really two ways to represent zero here. Um, or actually, there, there's really, um, uh, before we talk about the IEEE 754 standard, you can't really represent. Um, zero, um, given the format that I gave you, okay, because um, um, well, just to jump to it, um, um, I mean, if if you put in the right bits so that you end up with zero for the exponent. Um, I mean, the problem is, yeah, two to the zero is actually one, right? So to represent zero, you need, um, I mean, you really can't represent it as a real valued number. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, it's kind of like having a number where the exponent goes negative infinity, you know, really, really big negative exponent, right? Uh, but, but yeah, to, to jump to the IEEE 7554 standard, we really need, when we're doing floating point calculations, to represent have a way of representing zero exactly. So the way we do that is we use all zeros for the exponent um, and all zeros for the significant. So if all these bits are zero, that represents a zero, although um, the sign bit could be either a zero or one, right? So we're back to a sign magnitude kind of representation. So there's, there's two ways of representing zero um, for the IEEE 754 standard float here. All right, um, and I covered pretty much all that. There's more details then about the, the standard itself. So the, the stuff that, that I was all talking about here is really the, the, the description of the basic format, right? Um, and as, as it talks about here, there, there's really three binary basic formats, which is 32, 64, 128 bits. And then there's two others that um, use a 16-bit base, or you use, use um, um, 16 um, as the base. So, 
So that's kind of why there's five basic uh, standards here. Um, oh yeah, um, so let's let me jump back to let's look at the code here again. So let's see if we can we can kind of confirm this using um, um, our, some C code here. Um, so I had to do a little bit of manipulation um, to show the bit patterns on here. So there's the, if you guys are interested in the code, had to actually use a function to display out. The, the, the bit pattern correctly and also a union. Uh, but let, let's just describe this again. So, so basically, if you use floats on many programming languages, well, if you, if you use, uh, again, the computer architectures support floating point arithmetic, and they assume if you call an, uh, uh, an instruction to do uh, like a floating point multiply or something, they assume that the values you place in the registers that it's going to use as the operands are encoded using IEEE 754 encoding. Okay, so so we, we can see those encodings if we use like uh, float types. Um, so here, um, my my x six is actually uh, we we can view it either as a float or as a just a a, a set of thirty two bits an unsigned set of 32 bits here. Right? That's kind of what the union does, okay? So if we want to, if we want to view it as a float, we can do things like float, like, like assign floating point constants to it. So if you um, assign 0, 0.0 to x6 here, and if, if we display the float value of it, um, we'll get zero, right? If you look at the bit pattern, um, like I already described, um, um, the, the the representation defined by IEEE 754 is to use all zeros for the significant bits, all zeros for the exponent bits, um, and a zero for the sign bit. That represents zero. Okay, but you can also represent zero using um, uh, like positive zero. So if you um, if you store the bit pattern with just a one in the most significant bit, but everything again is all zeros. So remember eight. Uh, binary is one zero zero zero, and then all the rest of these bits um, are zero here. But if you store that in your float, um, um, you will see that, that the bit pattern, um, you know, you get the sign one bit, and, and if you display it, if you, if you output it, um, using like IO streams, C++ IO streams, or using printf in, in plain C, um, you'll see that it displays negative zero, right? I'm not certain if you can, um, I'm not certain if that will actually set to negative zero or not if you try and do, use like negative and then like a constant expression Oh, yep, that works too. So, so yeah, you can't do that too to also get a negative zero representation in, in your float there. Get your sign bit to negative. So. Um, all right, so let's let's confirm the rest of these things. So five point five. So 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 to, to to check this out though, you you know you would first have to represent decimal five point five um, as binary. Okay, so five point five is you know one zero one is five. Um, binary to uh, to the two so four plus uh, four plus one is five and then to the minus one um, location gives you one half right uh, or 0.5 right? uh, but if we normalize that this is 1.011 times uh, two to the two right right so, so, so to normalize this in binary scientific notation, you'd have to multiply by four or multiply by two to the two, which would move the decimal place over two places here. Again, moving the decimal place in base two, two places, is, is the same thing that you're probably used to like in base 10. So if I move it in two places in base 10, I'm, I'm really multiplying by two to the power of 10 or, or 100. 
Um, so if we set it to 5.5, uh, uh, if we display it, interpret it as a decimal number, we should see 5.5 get back out. And let's, let's look at the bit pattern here. So um, indeed, remember that in normal form, we assume that the most significant bit, bit before the radix point. So really only 0, 1, 1 should get encoded um, in our significant bits. And that's what you see, right? 0, 1, 1. Um, and then interpret this. Okay, so this is two to the power of two. Um, so remember, uh, what you have to do is is interpret this as um, these these are the exponent bits. So this is uh, if the magnitude of this is basically um, uh, one twenty eight. So two to the power of seven plus one. So this is one hundred twenty eight, right? Um, did I mess that up? 128, or it's 129. Yeah, that's right. So that's 129. Um, but remember that, that this is represented using the um, 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 the the biased representation. So we have to subtract the bias 127 from there, right? So, so anyway, so anyway, 129 minus 127 gives you two, right? So, so you're right. That that's representing the exponent of two um, in here, right? And this is um, this is oh, this was negative 5.5. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, here. So, so this was positive 5.5. .5 I first did. So the sign bit is zero, right? Um, and if we do negative 5.5, .5, you know, we get the same representation, but um, um, a sign bit of one. Um, so again, this is kind of sign magnitude. So, so, so we, unlike Q's complement, um, the, 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 the difference between negative and positive for IEEE floats is just the sign bit, but everything else should be the same. It should have exactly the same magnitude as expressed by the, um, the um, binary digits um, and the exponent, the, the, the binary um, biased uh, exponent. Um, so um, there's a couple of other, so, so zero is kind of a special representation, like I said. I mean, if, if you interpreted that, um, so all zeros is actually negative 127 as the exponent, right? Um, so this would, this would really be 1.0 1. Uh, 1. binary times 10 times, you know, 2 to the minus 127. Uh, if, if you strictly just used the um, significant and the exponents, which isn't quite zero. It's very small, but it's not quite zero, right? Uh, but, but anyway, so, so this is, this is, um, uh, an example of a special bit pattern that represents um, a special value zero. But there's a couple of other um, special bit patterns defined in, in the IEEE 754 standard. Um, so you can uh, you can um, you can um, represent calculations that, um, well, plus or minus infinity um, and not in numbers. Okay, so infinity, um, so for overflow, um, if your number is too big, um, sometimes you want um, the, instead of overflowing, to allow the calculations to keep calculating, but, but just say that anything too big is basically, you know, uh, too big for my system. So I'll just represent that as positive or negative infinity, right? So, so, so some one way that you can um, handle positive overflow, uh, a number that's too large to represent in your float, um, is, is if you do have overflow, just set the result to be infinity, positive or negative as, as needed, depending on which end you overflowed at, right? So to represent infinity, 
infinity is represented, uh, well, the sign is as you would expect. So zero for positive infinity and one for negative infinity. But if, 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 if there's all ones in the exponent and all zeros in the significand, um, the result will be interpreted as infinity instead of what that would be interpreted as um, for that exponent and, and fraction there, right? So, um, so um, actually, yeah, so, you know, if, if you tried to, to set like the maximum value that could be represented, that would be when you had all ones in the exponent and all ones in the significand. Um, and a zero in the sign bit. That would be the largest positive value you could get, except not quite, because that is actually um, um, a special value. That is um, 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 a, not a number that I'll talk about. Um, um, let me come back to that, okay? So, so I was talking about infinity here. So um, you, you could set positive infinity by hand or negative infinity by hand. Um, so, for example, for positive infinity, remember the sign bit should be one, so that, that should be one, a, a one there. But then the next eight bits should be zero, so the exponent should be zero. Um, so that's what, where these are coming from. Um, and then it should be all zeros in the um, exponent. So, so again, remember, there, there's three ones here, and then we get four more ones here. Remember your hexadecimal that we talked about in, in the last episode. So, so, so three ones in, in, at the end of the seven, and then another four gives you seven ones, and then there's one more one in the eight. So that, that's why we get the eight bits of the exponent being one there, right? So if you do that, um, and if you display that, um, you'll get um, positive infinity, right? Uh, and the same thing, but if you set uh, all of the first four bits to one, that, that's the negative infinity uh, in this case there. Um, so not a number is also useful for floating point operations. So um, this is often used for missing values. So if you ever do anything in like data analytics um, or, um, or data analysis or statistics, um, often when you have data sets, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rare if you have a big data set that you can get every value, you know, so that you'll, you'll often have missing data. And you'll need, need some way to um, handle it, okay? So one way is you can represent missing values using NAN, so not a number, okay? But the, the thing about NANs is if you try and do calculations with NANs, uh, usually what the, the correct thing to do is is any resulting so any like addition of a of a of a um, a, of a value that's um, a, a real value with a not a number should result in a in a in a not a number result okay so. So anyway, um, NAN is represented with um, the sign bit doesn't matter, um, but um, there's two kinds. Uh, but, but basically, again, the exponent has to be all one for NAN, like for infinity. Um, but um, the fra if the fractional part is non-zero, um, where the first bit is one, um, the first bit is one or zero, differentiates between these two different things, but then at least one other bit has to be non-zero. So if all the if all the bits are zero, that's an infinity. Um, and, and then, then if, if, if the exponents are all one, but um, some of the bits are non-zero, that's interpreted as not a number, right? Um, So anyway, you can um, uh, 
um, we had an example of that uh, here. So, so when we when we uh, did this the first time, um, this this had all of the exponents be one, and, and all the values were one. So this is an example. So, since since the first value, the significant must have been one as well. Since all the rest of the values were one, that must have been uh, an example of the, um, the the quiet, not a number there. So and and when we displayed that, you know. Um, we got NAN as the result from the stream, the C++ streaming um, library. Um, Okay, so let's go back to thinking about kind of the largest value that you can um, um, represent, right? So, um, So for example, um, here, where, where we're starting this again, you know, we're putting zero in the sign bit. Uh, this should be my bit pattern here. Um, and then you know, we can't use all ones. So, so if we want to get a very large number, um, all ones represent um, uh, are, are used for special values in the expo, the, the, the infinity not now. So, so the, the biggest one we can actually get is all ones except for the very last bit of our exponent okay so that's going to be two to the um uh, you know so, so all of those ones is uh, 120 um uh, eight remember using this biased representation so this is one less than that or 127 so this is effectively two to 127 uh and that's the biggest number the, the biggest number with all of these others one as well is, is the biggest that you can represent right so that, that comes out to basically 3.4 times e to the 38 decimal, right? So, so, so 2 to the 128 um, binary is about 10 to the 38 um, decimal, if you work it out. Um, so I was just trying to show a little bit of an example, some overflow here, although maybe we should move on. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, if, if, to overflow, like, like if you do an operation like adding, right? So, so, so uh, the, the problem is, is that this number is so big that I have in there right now, it's actually, you know, this 3.4 times 10 to the 38. It's so big that, that adding one actually adds a value that's way below the, the bits I can represent in the significant, okay? So, so uh, having 23 binary bits for the significant comes out to about 10 to 15 actual significant bits. So there's really only like 10 or 15 bits, or decimal digits that I can represent using 23 binary digits. So, so at most I can only have about 15 or so digits here. So that means that I have to add more than like one. You know, that, that, that's way below the, the significant digits I can represent here. So, but, but anyway, if you like add in like another 1e to the 38, that'll cause the value to overflow, right? Um, so again, here you, you can see that um, the, the, the result of that is, is this right here. So after I added in another 1e to the 38, we got a, um, again, a quiet overflow, but the result ends up being positive um, infinity here. And again, you can, you can see that, that the result after adding in 1e to 3, 38 is positive infinity again. That special representation for that. Um, oh, and you can, oh, you can, you can underflow um, as well. Uh, but again, oh, um, one last thing here before I move on from the representation. Um, so overflow is probably um, in, in scientific calculations and in general when doing floating point calculations, overflow is 
probably more of, of a issue than underflow, right? Because it could be that you just overflowed a little bit, you know, especially like if you're using a 32-bit float, uh, you could overflow that. that. That only goes up to a value of, of um, um, oh, well, I mean, still pretty big, but, um, but yeah, if you overflow that, um, infinity might not be a good approximation for that. You might want to go up to like a 64-bit float. Um, but when you underflow, I mean, these numbers are, are really very small. Um, so, so that this is the maximum, um, or the, the, the smallest value. Um, so the smallest number before underflow that you can represent is basically with all zeros uh, followed by a one in terms of the bit pattern, right? So, so that's what you get, that's like, uh, E to the minus one five. So you might wonder though that this is really two to the minus one twenty seven. Um, so this is using uh, our textbook talks a little bit about it. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, um, I'm not going to discuss it. Um, uh, but but. Numbers that get really small, um, it can be represented using the subnormal number. Okay, so you can, in fact, uh, get a look. Th th this extends the range. So there's a special thing, um, uh, a special notation to give you an idea of what that's doing. Basically, um, if, if the nor if the number goes subnormal, you interpret the um, um, the, the significant bits as if it's not in normal form anymore, okay? So you, you interpret these as if it's like 0. 0.0000 something. Um, so, which allows you to squeeze a little bit of, of more of the range out there. But, but if, if again, if, if you try and subtract a big enough, you can underflow it. And the normal thing to do for underflow is just to set the value to zero. That, that's kind of what I did for the very last example here. We, we subtract another 1 e to the minus 45, and that finally underflowed it too much to be represented as a subnormal number, um, and, and we get a positive zero again. So. Um, Okay, so that was that was um, kind of all about sort of the representation. Um, so back to the topic then of, of doing arithmetic with these values. Um, so I mean, actually, one kind of surprising thing about this is that to, to do um, addition and subtraction um, is that actually multiplication um, and division end up being slightly um, less complicated than addition and subtraction with, you know, IEEE 754 uh, representations of floats, right? And, and you know, the, the, the quick reason is that in order to addition or subtraction, you really, you first have to uh, convert one of the numbers uh, into the same um, Base or sorry, not same, but into the same um, um, range as the others. So you have to have the same exponent uh, before you add and subtract these. Okay, so you have to unnormalize one of the numbers um, if they don't have the same exponent before you can then um, do your addition or subtraction. Um, but to do multiplication or division, uh, you can just you can just multiply um, the um, significance, and you can just add the exponents, basically, right? Um, so so yeah, for addition or subtraction, you first have to unnormalize one of the numbers. You perform the addition. Um, and then you might have to renormalize it again before you get your result. 
For like addition of subtraction, basically you multiply using, um, uh, you know, in this case, the significant is unsigned. Um, so uh, it talks about it a little bit. So, so um, um, most likely what you would do is, is use an unsigned multiplication circuit um, and then set the sign based on the sign bit. Uh, and then you just have to add the exponent. So again, you just do a, a, an add. Um, and, and I believe like two's complement uh, for the biased, uh, you know, for, for the same kind of reason, you can just treat those as unsigned. So you just add those and, and you'll get the, the correct result. And a similar thing for division, although um, you might first take the reciprocal of one of the numbers and then do a multiplication. So. Um, uh, but yeah, a little more complicated like that. So, so they give a little bit of some, um, um, uh, a flow chart and some pseudocode for like the addition operation and subtraction operation. So, 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 you know, I, I touched on both some of these. Um, so, you know, since, since zero is represented uh, with a special format for um, um, IEEE floats, uh, you, you first would check for zero because you won't get the same, you won't get the correct result if one of those is zero and, and you add it um, as, as if you're not treating the, the, the format for zero as like a special value, right? So if one or both of them are zero, you can just return the other one, right? Otherwise, like I said, you have to align them. So, so you have to unnormalize one of them so that they have the same exponent. Um, then do the add or subtract. And then renormalize. Um, so, what else should we mention? So, so likewise, they gave a bit of a um, um, algorithm for multiplication. So has some similar steps. So you'd probably, you, you would start by checking for zeros again, since that's a special value. Um, if either is zero, you'd want to report that. Um, although of course for division, um, if the divid dividend is zero, that actually raises an error, or division by zero error. Um, um, and then you would go about like for multiplication, um, adding the exponents, checking for exponent overflow or underflow. So that would be only if the exponent overflows or underflows um, is, is your real indication of whether your number is too big or too small to be represented in your float standard you're calculating with. So, and, and multiplied significance. Um, but yeah, then like before, your, your um, product would be double the, the length of the value. So, you know, you'd have to, again, this would be built into your circuits um, um, somehow. So you'd have to use multiple registers to hold the, the product when you do this multiplication, which, which again is going to um, require like some sort of shifting and adding um, for a sign multiplication here. And then normalize and round the result again. Okay. Uh, and then the final thing I'll mention, um, I mean, you know, I probably should spend some, a little bit more time in this, but, but rounding is an important consideration um, for computer architecture, floating point arithmetic, right? So for your computations to be accurate, you need to make certain that um, when you're doing the operations that you're not introducing bias into the calculations. Um, so, I mean, first of all, um, the result um, of any operation um, um, is going to be often longer than, uh, than, than your original format. So when you put your result back, you know, the extra bits have to be eliminated. Um, 
So, and I mean, another thing that I should emphasize a little bit more is that, um, I mean, floating point numbers in a computer are, are approximations. Um, um, you can never, you know, there's an infinity of, of floating point numbers between any two points on the number line that you might want to represent. And there's only a finite number of, of things that you can actually represent using the floating point representation. So your, your, your representation is always going to be an approximation, right? So because of that, you have to worry about rounding. If you're doing, you know, remember that a computer can, can do like billions of, of operations uh, in, in a second, right? So if, if you have bias um, in your approximations, um, that will quickly accumulate. So you have to be careful about how you round the things. Um, so those extra bits of your significant, if you have too many of them, you have to, you have to come up with some way of, of you know, ignoring or removing the, the least significant bits when you go to return the result back from doing a multiplication or some other operation, right? So the simplest you could do is just, um, um, you could just truncate the values. Uh, that would be effectively rounding towards zero because the, 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 the bits that you're truncating um, would be, if any of them are non-zero, would make the, the, the value a little bit further away from zero. So either a bigger positive or a bigger, bigger negative number. But um, that is a, a, bad, um, res, um, a bad way to approximate these. Because if, if you're always rounding towards zero, you're always going to be biasing towards your result being a little bit smaller um, than it actually is, right? So that can, that can quickly accumulate. So, um, usually you want to round to the nearest, um, but um, as, as it talks a little bit about in our textbook, um, it is possible to get a value that so so if you end up with um, a, a one on the, the the next bit that needs to be dropped and all the rest are zeros um, in that case it's exactly equal between rounding up or rounding down so as it talks a little bit about um, but Again, it's not a good idea to always just round up. So, um, so IEEE standard, um, um, I, I think, basically um, um, defines that you should use like round to the nearest. Um, and then, in, in the case of, of being exactly midway, um, it it, it uh, the value is rounded up if the last representable bit is currently one um, and it's not rounded up if it's currently zero, okay? So, so this is a good thing. So you don't wanna just select it at random, whether to round up or round down. That would add, that would put in some non-deterministic behavior into your computation. So you always have to get the same result or the, the processor should always get the same result if you do the same calculation with the same um, two, um, numbers right so this way uh, this is a deterministic way of sometimes going up and sometimes going down if it's exactly in between so, um, all right so yeah I'm, I'm kind of losing my voice here and it's a lot later than I kind of wanted to go um, anybody have any final questions um, um, I've only got two people here at the moment. So. Um, if not, I'll go ahead and let you guys go. So have a good night. Hopefully that was of some use to you on uh, looking at the problems and stuff in this chapter. Uh, yeah. So I will see you guys all later then.
Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's it.